All right, Ian. Ian, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Um, I am from Chicago, uh, Illinois, specifically more towards like the northwest side of Chicago. So like Wicker Park, Humboldt Park um, area. Um, what was your family like growing up? My dad wasn't really in the picture like that actively. My mom was a single mom for most of her life, but she's also gay. So I, uh, I grew up with a little bit of adversity in my family. It's like kind of allowed me to understand a little bit differently. I feel like, you know, just seeing things and just the way you process things through that. And then I have a sister who's 25 um, with borderline personality disorder. So I grew up with her for a little while and then we separated um, for, for just a little bit um, in our teenage years. But yeah. How, how would you describe your childhood in general? Um, I would say it's a lot of scattered moments that I'm still trying to piece together. You know, um, I spent a lot of time moving, you know, to different parts of the city, um, predominantly grew up in a lot of like lower income neighborhoods. And uh, I was always just like a sore thumb because like I'm a white kid um, in the middle of the hood, you know? <laughs> but it, I, I think it's, uh, I'll always look at it as a positive, you know? I will never compromise my personality just for where I'm at. You know, it's just, I'm always be this person. Um, but yeah. You finished high school? I did finish high school, barely though. I didn't want to, but I did it just to appease, you know, my, my grandparents and my, my mom, really. Um, I just, I didn't feel like math and science are like my favorite thing. I loved art, I loved like um, art classes, music classes, anything creative, but I very much shied away from like mathematics, I would have you know, that girl threw my homework for five bucks, you know, it's just. <laughs> and what'd you do when you graduated? Um, after I graduated, um, I started doing, actually after I graduated, I kind of, I got kicked out of the house when I was 15 um, by my mom for like, I was like truant from school. I would, wouldn't come home until like four o'clock in the morning. I was just like a, generally a bad kid um, because I was like looking for a father figure. Um, I was dealing with past traumas of like sexual assault and um, physical abuse. Um, so when I got out of high school, it was almost like I'm free. Like I can go do whatever the hell I want, wherever I want. Um, so I kind of like got into this spiral of like using drugs after high school a little bit heavier than I had been using them during high school. Um, but I also started pursuing my creative career and um, I had done some like art shows and done some like live performances with my music, um, which was really a blessing. You know, it's like really cool to be able to make things that people love or, you know, want to listen to every day. And then like, You'll be hanging out with somebody and they're singing your song to you. It's like really wild. Um, so yeah. How'd you end up in LA? So my best friend this past year passed away from fentanyl. Um, he had schizophrenia and he was staying at my house for a little while. And then um, he ended up moving to Indiana for a little bit. And we kind of like, we would still communicate, but it was just like harder to communicate. Uh, but he would use cocaine to deal with the voices that he was hearing. And he, he would tell me and our friends that it would like make the voices go away and it would make him feel like he could go out in public and be around us. Um, but it was just a psychosis that he was in. He just really was looking for help. And um, he overdosed on laced coke. Someone laced his cocaine with fentanyl. And I had actually just started using fentanyl at the time. And so it was like really like a, a shock to me. But one of the last conversations me and him had over text, one of the last times I spoke to him before he passed away, 
we had talked about coming out here and like living out here and starting to do music and art out here because we just weren't happy in Chicago anymore. Like we, we oftentimes focus a lot on like Syria and like what's going on overseas. And that is important and very important thing. But we have 10, 11 year old kids in America holding semi-automatic assault rifles too. But we don't talk about that because it's not making us money. You know, um, the gangs in Chicago are a whole nother breed. Oh, gangs are a whole nother breed. Um, it, it literally, that's the thing is like out here in LA, you got MS, you got Crips, you got Bloods. You might have a few other like stragglers from different gangs, maybe some Aryan brothers, maybe whatever, you know, just penitentiary and, and street gangs, you know? The way it works in Chicago is if you took LA and you just went, just squished it right together it's the streets are not like one block out here is probably like two three city blocks where i'm from so like everything's just mushed together and smushed together and half the year you spend inside isolated from other people because it's just too cold to go out so you just people build up these frustrations and these angers and these evils um and it's almost like the city doesn't want us to learn. The city doesn't want us to grow. They don't want us to shy away from guns and drugs. They want us to consume it, you know? Um, I, one of the biggest things I noticed growing up from like, when I was like in high school and I was old, old enough to understand politics a little bit, um, there was a lot of school closings in Chicago and they were shutting down schools. And it's like, well, if I can't teach kids right from wrong, what are they gonna go out and do? Do the wrong things, you know? Gangs fall into that setting as well. Like they, it, it's, it's sad, it's fucked up, but they usually attack in your home life or they're gonna attack in your school life or they're gonna attack in your street life. But somewhere they're gonna try to grab onto you and say, this is a better family. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not a gang member, nor am I really affiliated with any type of uh, gangs, but I've had friends who are, who have died from gun violence in Chicago. I had one of my friends, Adam, pass away um, like about almost a year ago now, uh, got shot nine times in front of his house. Um, and it, literally a week before I saw him, I told him he was just, you, every time he'd eat, someone would knock on the door, yo. He would load his pistol, cock it, and it's just like, yo, chill. like we're safe, you're around your friends, like you don't have to worry, but you just saw this like fear in his eyes that just was like almost keeping him alive in a weird way because he was just so scared. Like, you know, I, I Chicago is, is a, they don't have resources like they have here in LA. Like they don't have mental health resources like they got out here. They don't pass out Narcan. You can't have a tent on the side of the street. Like a lot of the things that happen is not the same for Chicago, you know? Um, I've personally, in my own experience, seen, you know, racism in police. And I think police are also a systematic uh, gang. It's just a gang that's a little bit more appreciated by society, like a mafia, you know? Um, but I've seen cops, you know, racially profile my friends. Um, and then I'm sitting there, the only person who actually did something wrong and they won't arrest me, but they're taking my friends in. It's just like weird stuff, like, you know, like, I feel like because I'm a white man, you know, um, in America, I am at liberty to speak on what I see and what I notice and not lie about it, you know? I, uh, I could deny that there's racism in America. I could deny that there's violence in Chicago. I could deny that School is important, but I'd be lying, you know? And that's a, a big part of actually one of the reasons why I wanted to come in here and do this in the first place is just being like honest. It's like, this is my place to be honest and tell my story so people know that they're not alone. Like, you know, I, uh, this past year went to rehab um, and got sober for around like seven months. And while I was in rehab, I got diagnosed with uh, complex PTSD. My entire life, I was trying to figure out what was wrong with me, why I was the way I am. I was like, there's ADD, it's bipolar, it's, you know, you have a mood disorder. Like it was all these things. And it wasn't until they told me complex PTSD, CP at PTSD, that it finally like clicked with me. And I was like, actually that makes a lot of sense. You know, um, just due to like the early life, like so, some of the youngest memories I have are, 
somebody assaulting me, you know, sexually. Um, some of the earliest memories I have are of like just violent nature in my home and around my house. And it's like, no one wants that. No one plans for that, but it's just the way the world is, you know? When you have kids raising kids, you know, my mom had my sister when she was 20, had me when she was 23. That's a child raising a child, you know? There's no right way to do this. She just tried the best she could. But from that, we also have to build our own experiences and our own knowledge and we have to fuck up to, we have to mess up to like learn, you know, and to, to better ourselves. Um, it's almost like trial and error. So that's why when you asked me what I did after high school, uh, you know, after my high school career, it was like, I kind of just went buck wild to see how far I could go with it. And then I was like, I reeled it in slowly when I realized it was kind of not healthy for me, but. How old are you now? I'm 22, I'm still young, you know? Uh, I get told that on a regular basis, you're so young, you could do so much. And like, I guess I can do so much, you know? I gotta just find my niche and just find the people that, you know, I can speak to and just help them. Like, that's the biggest thing is it's like, where I'm from, there isn't a lot of support systems. So like a big thing in my life is now developing support systems and trustworthy groups of people that I can put myself around so I never have to deal with the past again. So I'm not repeating this cycle. Cause you know, I've been stabbed, you know, I've, I've put myself in bad situations and karma came back to me and put me in, you know, like really crazy, uncomfortable situations. But, you know, part of that is the growth and development of becoming an adult, you know? And that's like things you have to go through. I definitely noticed there's a difference between the way that my mom treats my sister and the way that she treats me. In, in no way loving though, it's the love is the same. But when it comes to like taking care of my sister, my mom's always been willing to take that extra mile. And it's almost like as a man in society, I've kind of had to take that step myself. I kind of had to be my own parent, cook for myself, you know, pay my own bills, you know. Um, but I'm glad I did. You know, I wouldn't have life any other way. It's, it's as, as fucked up as I am, as screwy and fucked up as I am, I wouldn't have it any other way. Because a lot of people right now are getting to the age of 22 and dying before they ever get a chance to really change the world the way they want it. I'm still here. So if I can make that change, you know what I mean? Like, why not do it? You know, that's, that's why I'm a creative. That's why I do art. That's why I do it, all this stuff. It's because I can't talk about how I, 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 well, I can talk about it, but I don't know the proper way to express what it felt like to be assaulted as an adult or a child. You know what I mean? Like, um, it, it's just one of those things where like when you get into a creative space, you can say all of that without ever saying anything, you know, and people can feel it. Um, and I've also learned that your family, you don't have to like, my mom obviously is not supportive of the face tattoos, the arm tattoos and everything like that. But something in my spirit and in my heart told me this is who I was gonna be forever. Like, um, so when I did it, it was a commitment that I was making to a craft, a commitment I was making to a lifestyle that I wanted to be happy in my skin and with this identity. And as I started doing that, I realized more about beauty comes from within. And, you know, I wasn't trying to deal with what came inside. I was just trying to blast the front side of it so people would see something else. You know, I feel like it's almost like a camouflage. Like I got tattoos on my face so that most people don't want to approach and talk to me because I have bad PTSD and I don't know how this conversation is going to go because I fear what I don't know without ever trying it, you know? So I'm like, oh, fuck, like, I have these tattoos, people will think I'm scary or like, which is probably not the case or it might be, but you know, it just, it was one of those things where like giving myself this barrier allowed me to understand the way I came off to other people and it allowed me to liberate myself. You know, um, my mom told me that she would disown me as her son if I ever got a face tattoo. So I got Bezos on my face so that I could always have my mom give me kisses, yeah. You know, even if she never kissed me again, but she still does. In time, she's gotten more comfortable with it. Um, but yeah, she didn't like 13 year old me with tattoos. That probably wasn't her, her, her favorite thing. Um, it's, it's interesting how you and I grew up because I grew up 10 miles west of where you grew up. Yeah, like, and, you know, it's and, wild. And different, different Austin Divide is literally like right there. 
So like you could walk over one street, like I see, it's so strange, like being in this side of the city. So you're on like, let's say you're on like Austin and Lake, right? There's a little church's chicken right here and they got a little bodega right across the street or whatever you want to call it, corner store or whatever. And um, bodegas are more like New York and out here. But uh, you'd have a little corner store and everything like that. And literally, if you walk one block west towards like, you know, like Kenzie and, you know, everything like that, you're in the hood like so fast. But you walk in like two blocks into Oak Park and you're like, oh, this is so nice. Like, that's like what's so strange about Chicago is you have these polarities, these intense polarities. Like if you go to the east side of Chicago, like for a while I was living on 73rd and Coles, which is like the far, like that's South Shore. So that's like the far east side. It's like more towards the hundreds and then like towards Gary. Um, and when I was living over there, like, you know, it was like way different than being over wet on the west side. You know, it had its similarities. I'm still in the same city, but it felt like I was in a completely different place, you know? Um, and I feel like- Much more dangerous? Yeah and no. I think it's all, for me, like, I understand the imminent danger. I think you pay $1,500 to fucking possibly get shot living in Chicago. Like, that's the price you pay. You're like, oh, here's $1,500 and I might die. You know, um, and, and that's always just been something to register with me just because of experience. Like I've seen so many people die. Like one of the last articles I read in the news before I left Chicago, when I was like just fed up and tired was, uh, I think like an eight year old, eight month old baby got shot in traffic on Lakeshore Drive because of um, an angry driver. They shot into the side of a car over somebody like cutting them off. Like that's insane. Like the, the, you can get that worked up so fast that you can take a life from somebody or try to take a life from somebody and then an innocent life. You know what I mean? It's not even the person who did it almost. It's an innocent life, you know? Um, but we're more worried about how much gas costs when we already made electric cars. And I see that a lot in society, period. I see a lot of people um, using their success to glamorize instead of change. Um, if Cardi B spent any amount of that money she spent on the fucking diamond nipple fucking things at her Meta Gala dress, it was like, all right, each one of those diamonds, one of the diamonds, not all the other diamonds that she had on there, just one of the diamonds, the major diamonds that she had that looked like a nipple, okay? Literally each one of those diamonds costs like $30,000. You wore that one night and never wore it again. Who are you helping by doing this? Like who, who benefited it from but you? And I, that's like, that's kind of where my head is as, as a 22 year old me white man in America. It's just like, what did that do for society? Who did you help by doing that? But we are just doing a lot of things to look cool. We want to look cool. It's way cooler to be high on drugs because society's telling you to do it, you know? And I think that's a, no one wants to talk about the the hard things because it's just way easier to, you know. The, the more I do this project, the more I see the that the wealth gap is the biggest problem we have. Mm, hey, I like that. In this I country. Like because I would agree. Because you'll have people like doing things like what you just described. If you gave me a million dollars. The wealthier, the wealthier are just, you know, taking it as far as they can and, and the poor just get left behind. Yeah. So you get you get these broken families that leave children with without good parents, without good role models, without a good you education, could, you without could have opportunity. All the money in the world and have a wonderful family, but you could have no money at all and have a wonderful family. Yeah, but but the but the wealth extreme that yeah, but it does makes it harder. It, it does make it harder because of the way that we. It's it's kind of what I was getting at. Who did you help buying that dress for yourself? Yeah, right. Yourself. You know, as where you could have put on a t-shirt, I donated all the money that I was gonna spend on a dress to hungry kids over in, you know, or like to help relief funds over in Syria. And then that's a movement, bro. You just made a whole movement and you look 10 times cooler. If, if more or all of us did that, yeah, it you know, the, it and changed the country. There's people who even claim to be politically woke and politically understanding and have this understanding, but when they're given opportunities to show how enlightened and uh, how free and, and, and how much change they want from the world and then from America, 
they fish out. They would rather look cool on TV. And I and that's a big thing, is it's just very superficial. You know, like no one no one wants to sit down and have a conversation about their trauma. I will though, because somebody's gotta do it. You know what I mean? And by doing this, I open up a door for other 22 year old people to reach out to you or to me and be like, hey, I'm struggling with this. Do you have any advice? Could you point me in the direction of somebody who knows what I'm going through? And then you create a uh, foundation and almost a, a community that now can help each other. And that's the thing with complex PTSD is most treatment for complex PTSD does not work. Um, it's actually can be negative. It can negatively affect the person who's trying to seek that. Most treatment comes from cognitive behavioral therapy. And the other portion comes from talking to people who deal with people who have it or talking to people who actually have complex PTSD. So it's, it's from finding out that I had this disorder, I had to build a whole community around finding myself trying to get better. And it was hard at first because it's, it, it was hard to, well, how do I bring this up in a conversation? How do I talk to somebody about the million times I've been fucked over in life? You know, the time I got stabbed or the time I got assaulted or the abusive relationships I grew up in, you know? And, and I, like I said, I've never traded for the world, but in, in retrospect, it's like, now I have to deal with it. And finding that support system where I was in a city that's so filled with hate and evil you know, even our even our own mayor, like Lori Lightfoot, well, not my mayor anymore because I don't live there, but Lori Lightfoot like is a joke. Like she does not take her job seriously. Like she's trying to fit so much into popular culture and reach out to a youthful audience that she's just getting a bunch of people laughing at her because she sounds dumb, you know? Um, on a funny note, just because you're gay and and of, a minority group doesn't mean that you're automatically the best thing ever. And just that, that goes for anybody. That's any race, any sexuality, anybody, you know? Um, but you got to do what's honest and true to you to help people. And when you're sitting here trying to pose like you're a 13 year old kid on Twitter to help Chicago as a whole, you're trying to tap into one audience when it's the bigger picture, you know? I think that it doesn't just, this is something that can be talked about for Chicago specifically. Um, there needs to be a major reform in Chicago, in my opinion. I think that there needs to be less prison time and more mental health. Uh, I think there needs to be more schools opening and less, less liquor stores. You know, I think that we need to actually fucking figure out a way to, um, what's it called, gentrify areas properly so that we're not pushing minority groups out. We're actually keeping minority groups where they're centralized and bringing more people of different ethnicities and cultures into that area so they can learn more about that culture and, and be more understanding and empathetic and sympathetic, you know? Instead of running for mayor in Chicago, you're out in LA smoking fentanyl on the street. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but see, that's the thing is, I don't think I'd be happy sitting behind a desk, you know, um, doing all the other legalities that come with being a mayor. But uh, I'll, I'll say it like this, Chance the Rapper. Chance the Rapper's dad was a large part of Obama's political campaign. Now, because he had a son who was in an industry, he probably was able to tap into an audience that he wouldn't have been able to tap into if his son wasn't a musician that was prom prominent and successful in Chicago. Plus, I've met, I've met Chance. He's a wonderful person. Like, his brother, d terrible people. Like, I will admit that to you, homophobic, even in his own light of coming out in recent, I feel like it's just all for media. It's all what media wants to hear, so he sounds better. But Chance was actually a pure person. I met him and I saw like, somebody who wanted to change our city, somebody that loved our city, but wanted things to be better. You know, um, even down to somebody like a mainstream rapper, G Herbo, who, who makes drill music, which is predominantly talking about violence, drugs, and sex. Even he started opening up schools like Montessori schools and different schools in Chicago because he understands there's a problem. And that's like, that's a step in the right direction. That's where we can go with it, you know? 
But to have a bunch of people who are disassociated from our youthful reality and what's going on right now. And, you know, Lori Lightfoot's just getting to a point where America's accepting the fact that she's queer. You feel me? So that's probably a big thing to her, you know? I'm already living in a world where it's okay to be queer. And if you want to fucking act like something's wrong with it, we can box, yeah? And that's partly where I come from. It's like, it's a very like firm, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna step down from where I'm standing. Cause that's, there's not enough people standing up for the what's right. I think the best piece of advice I've ever received, right? Was from a drunk man in a bar, but he was so on point though, it was great. He said, there's your side, right? There's my side and then there's the right side. Which side do you choose? And I thought about it for a second. I was like, the right side, obviously, right? And that, and that is the right answer. But it took me a second. And the fact that it took me a second is I had my own selfish desires within a conversation with somebody where I didn't even have to be selfish, you know? Well, I'm right, duh. Well, maybe I'm not right. Maybe there's a right way to do it, though. Um, I think racism, um, sexism, uh, homophobia stems from lacks of knowledge, the lack of knowledge. I don't think people are actually racist. I just think they're dumb. I think they're really stupid and no one told them differently. Or no one showed it to them in a way that made sense for them and it didn't quite comprehend. Um, I think that what the problems you see with society I will say are real, they're valid, and they should be understood and heard. But in my reality as somebody younger than you, my group of society has already dealt with that and we already know that your melanin doesn't matter, yeah. That your sexually does, sexuality doesn't matter. But that's even a bridge. Like I got homies who are, down, are homophobic and it's just because they've never taken the time to understand that it's just another person, homie. You know, now I, I will admit that, you know, like I've had some experiences in while in Chicago um, with like gay men coming on to me and I definitely was very uncomfortable and they were very kind of like almost malicious with it. Um, but at the same time, I never let them get to a point where it was cross, in my adult life at least, you know, like when I was old enough to, fight back when I was old enough to speak up, when I was old enough to make that difference, I might as well make that difference, you know, and not stay silent. Because if I stay silent, there's one more person that's living in silence too, you know? But if I, if I tell the world the truth and I'm like, hey, here's my situation, like I could be honest, and I, like this my, is this my truth. I'm a drug addict with complex PTSD and I'm just trying to figure out how to make it work for me. And if I make it work for me, I can help other people make it work for them. And, that, and, that, and that's just literally like all I want. Like, how am I gonna do it? Art, um, music, photography, the things that I know how to do so that somebody who does analytics and somebody who does business can somehow feel that feeling that I have and be like, I agree with this change, this, this worldly change that he talks about, I agree with this. And I'm in a totally different industry. And that, that's real equality and unity, is real equality and unity says, there is not four races, there is one race. And that is the human race. We all bleed the same. We all have blue blood on the inside, red blood on the outside. So if you understand that, it, and, and, and for me, it's enlightening to think this way, in my opinion. Like, I think this way and I'm like, all right, I'm, I, feel, I feel happy knowing that I'm not stuck in a racist mindset, trapping myself, you know? Because some of the best things in life that I've, that I've come to see aren't of me and do not come from me and do not come from people who look like me. But I appreciate it the same. And that's like, that's, so with cognitive behavioral therapy, it's kind of rewiring your brain to deal and think about the trauma differently. 
while doing this, and I still do it a lot, and I'm still trying to learn. You know, I'm still trying to learn every day. If I'm not learning, why am I doing it? You know, it was even telling the homie, you know, out there, I was like, you know, what's nice about this is I can go back and look at a video of myself when I was 22 and be like, wow, so much has changed in this time, but yet I was still onto something, you know? And then you just build upon it. It's just all about building it, like, you know, and building the world to be the way that you want it. Because things are gonna happen to you that you cannot control. And you have to accept the things that you cannot control, but you have to be able to change them and know when to change them and not to change them. And if you really think about that, that leads into one construct of a lot of addiction, which is the serenity prayer, which is the AA meetings. And it's just building a regimen that is healthier and happier for your life. You know what I mean? Ian, what an amazing talk. Thank you. Likewise. That was that really was fun. Really fucking nice. I appreciate that. We should do this again in a year or two and see where you're at. I would love to. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I would love to. That I would love to come back here and do this again. Because, like I said, next year I might have a whole new piece. You know, you're an interesting young man. Thank you. Like you're 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 a cool dude. I appreciate you allowing me to.